All right. Well, um, it's been uh, it's been almost a month, I guess, since our last one. Um, so I wanted to give a kind of a quick sort of overview of kind of what we what we went over last time. Last time we read we read First Nephi six, which is um, the uh, the first time that Isaiah is quoted in the Book of Mormon. Um, so I want to give a kind of a quick overview, and then we'll talk about chapter seven. I don't know. Hopefully, we'll get to that today. Chapter seven is what Nephi says about chapter six, about the words of Isaiah. So anytime we read the Book of Mormon, I think it's a good idea once in a while to go back and read the title page, because the title page of the Book of Mormon tells you why we have the book. Um, lots of people have put lots of reasons why the book exists. Uh, like, for example, the LDS say that it's another testament of Jesus Christ. They put that on their on their Book of Mormon co- versions. Um, and not that it's not a testament of Jesus Christ, but it doesn't say that's the, the main purpose of it. Uh, some people um, say it's to prove the church is true or, you know, there's all kinds of various reasons why people think we have the Book of Mormon or to, or to be another witness of the Bible, you know. Um, but the Book of Mormon itself tells us why we have it. And um, <clears throat> this was taken off the title page. Um, the title page was actually printed at the back of the book, of uh, uh, the back of the plates. Um, and so when Joseph translated that, it was actually written by, he, we think it was Moroni, uh, or I mean Mormon, but it, it almost appears like Mormon wrote the first part and Moroni wrote the second part. So we don't know for sure exactly who wrote it, but it was on the plates for the and translated by the, through the uh, interpreters. Um, so we are supposed to have. It. So skipping down to verse six, it's telling us what the purpose of the book is. To show unto the remnant of the house of Israel how great things the Lord hath done for their fathers. So it's to let the house of Israel know what God has done, the covenant that he made with Abraham, why, why, you know, how much he loves them. Um, and also that they may know the covenants. So what is their part in this? What's their role? What's the covenant that God has made? And that they are not cast off forever. So that they'll know that they're not abandoned. They're not left, left to, to their own, you know, to die. They're God is still going to keep his part of the covenant. And also, the second part is, and also to the convincing of the Jew and the Gentile, which is who? Us, us is the Gentiles, right? And the Jews. Is there any other group of people that that's not referring to? Lost tribes. It's everybody, right? It's everybody. So, <laughs> mention of the Jew and Gentile, that Jesus is the Christ the eternal God, the only true eternal God. Shane, yes. I don't mean to get you off course, but can we talk just real quickly about who is the remnant of the house of Israel? You know, we think, okay, the remnant of the house of Israel are current Jews in Israel. Or we could say the remnant of the house of Israel are the descendants of, of Nephi and Jared and came over. Or it could be all. Mm-hmm. If someone were to ask you, who is the remnant of the house of Israel? Which would be your interest? Well, I think it's a kind of a multi-layered question. I think that there, there is a certain element of the sort of DNA kind of inheritance type of thing. Um, but I also think that a large part of it is spiritual. Um, it would be truly impossible to say that this person is the tribe of whatever, and this person is the tribe of whatever, and from a DNA perspective, because even right back from the very beginning, so Joseph married an Egyptian, right? His wife was Egyptian. So Ephraim and Manasseh right there are halves, you know, they're half Jewish or half house of Israel, you know? And so, and you take that, you extrapolate that out over several thousand years, there's very little of any pure kind of DNA left. So to say that, you know, so-and-so is this tribe, you know, from a purely DNA standpoint is, I don't see how you could do it. Um, well, I, 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 I've always looked at it as it's talking about the literal house mm-hmm. of Israel. If you could trace back mm-hmm. that, you know, but I like we, what you said about spiritual people who were baptized. You know, there's that whole thing that there are the, the trees and the branches being grafted. Right. You know, I think as believers, we are spiritually remnant of the house of Israel. 
Yeah. You know, the word adopted into that lineage. Right. And the Book of Mormon is very clear on that. Those that repent and come unto Christ, they are, they become the seed of Lehi. Mm -hmm. You know, so everybody here, if we've truly repented of our sins and come unto Christ, then we're not Gentiles anymore. As spiritually speaking, we are of the seed of Lehi. You know, so um, it is a very complicated, layered question. So I don't really have a quick, short answer, but I do think we should focus more on the spiritual aspect of the repent, the repentance part. Yeah. Okay. So in light of in light of this understanding that the purpose of the Book of Mormon, you know, Mormon and Moroni had the had the luxury of being able to hold the plates, interpret the plates, see the plates, and look back from the day they were given, you know, all the way up until them. I mean, they had the brass plates, they had it all in the library, right? And so they had the the ability to look back and kind of give a good summary over why we why do we have this? Why did God go to all the trouble? And you think about just the interpreters alone. So the interpreters were the brother of Jared had the interpret created we, he either made them or God gave them to him out of the stones, right? The two the two clear stones. Those were the interpreters that were used. And you think about that. Those that was in like what twenty five hundred BC, and they were preserved all that time. And passed down to generations and given, you know, to, to the Nephites. And then eventually, you know, in the hand of Joseph Smith to be able to translate this record. I mean, that's a, that's an amazing thing, just that alone. So why did so why did God put all that energy into making sure that we had this record available? And this is this is where we find out why. Because he wants his covenant people, those that repent and come unto Christ, he wants them, those that are lost to him, that don't even know. Their heritage, um, or that, the, or the, or anything about the covenant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and their father, his forefathers, to know they're not lost. That he has, there is no lost tribes to God. We we call it the ten lost tribes, but God hasn't lost any tribes. He knows exactly who everyone is, and the covenant that He has made. And also, it's for us as Gentiles to know that Jesus is the eternal God, that He's not just another human that was good. He, he is God in the flesh. Um, and so in light of that, um, we'll, we'll go look at what Mar what uh, Nephi has done in talking to his brothers. So he quotes from Isaiah extensively, both in 1 Nephi and 2 Nephi. And so I went through the Book of Mormon. I've spent, it's kind of been good to have this month off because I've done a lot of research. Um, and so Isaiah is pretty fascinating, and I can understand why he continually quoted from Isaiah was because it fit the whole purpose of the Book of Mormon, to, to, for the people to repent, for the people to know what the covenants are that God made with them through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, to know that his people are not lost, that, that you know, even though they're scattered, they're not lost to God. That's the theme of Isaiah all the way through, and that he was going to send this Messiah to save his children. And so I went through the Book of Mormon and I found every reference that where there's any kind of quote of Isaiah or mention of Isaiah or re-paraphrasing of Isaiah. And I created a kind of a, a highlight of each one um, and just kind of a, like a summary of what that what those verses mean. But let's talk about first of all, let's talk about who Isaiah was. So Isaiah has got multiple names in the scriptures. Um, Isaiah, Is Isaias or Isaias, and then Isaias is the Greek name of, of, of Isaiah. Um, and so it, all of these names mean Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh was God's name, the name of God. Um, and then, so he lived around the time of 740 BC. So about 140 years before they left Jerusalem, uh, Lehi. So, you know, he would have been contemporary, like he would have been like to, to us, what let's say Joseph Smith was as far as distant time wise, um, about 140, 150 years before then. Um, he uh, Isaiah prophesied in Judah, um, in the southern kingdom for uh, 64 years. You remember the kingdoms were divided into two, the northern and southern kingdom. He was the prophet of the southern, or one of the prophets of the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, he did so for about 64 years. So he had a long period of time where he prophesied. Um, until about 686. And he had other counterparts in the northern kingdom, other prophets. 
um, Amos, Hosea, Jonah, and Micah, they all prophesied in the northern kingdom about the same time. And the message was very consistent to Israel to repent, to come unto Christ, to turn away from idolatry. It was always kind of the same message uh, that God was trying to get their attention. Now, during this time, the northern kingdom had got taken into um, bondage by the, uh, the Assyrians. Um, so Isaiah was very highly educated, at least they believe so. Um, and the main reason is because his vocabulary was so high. Um, he had his, the book of Isaiah has 25,608 words, and 2186 of those are unique words. Um, and you compare that to like Jeremiah, which has it's a slightly bigger book. It's got 32,000 words, but only 1,600 of them are unique. Can you say unique? You mean they're not found anywhere else in the Bible? No, meaning that they're like, he, he, he didn't use the same word over and over. He has a big vocabulary. Yeah, he didn't repeat words. Um, <clears throat> Isn't a lot of that he actually referred to God in context, using a specific name or context? Like Emmanuel, that kind of thing. Yeah. Used with that yeah, instead of just saying God. Yahweh, he would say Emmanuel, which means God with us when he's talking about Jesus, you know, and things like that. Yeah. Um, so tradition, now this is not in the scriptures, just church tradition, um, says that he was cut in half by King Manasseh. The story is, is that he climbed in a tree to hide. Um, you know, prophets were not, prophets were not loved. Prophets, because they were calling everybody to repent. Um, and so, the tradition is that he hid from King Manasseh, who was the king of Israel um, or Judah, and he they they cut the tree in half with him inside of it. That was that's what the story is that happened. Um, but that's again not not in the scriptures. Um, interestingly enough, the book of Isaiah is quoted in the New Testament more than any other Old Testament book. Um, so not only did Nephi and the prophets of the Book of Mormon love Isaiah, so did the New Testament uh, writers. Okay, um, and so he spoke of five main topics, and this just kind of over high overview topics in his book, the glory and greatness of God, the sin of both Israel and Gentile nations, and the judgment that would come as a result, the scattering and the gathering of Israel back to God, uh, the first and second coming of Jesus and the tribulation of the last days, as well as the peace that you'll have by living in, in, in righteousness, living with God. So that's just kind of a quick overview of who, who was Isaiah as a, as a prophet. So what I, like I said, I went through all the references in the Book of Mormon. I did kind of the same thing. I like a quick little overview of the verse. So here's, here's what I found. So I've got the RLDS reference here. LDS there, and then where it is in Isaiah. Um, so th this one was to convince, to believe in Christ and have hope, to declare that God is going to do a marvelous work among men, to learn about God and glorify his name, to understand that God will only preserve the righteous believers. Non-believers will be destroyed. God keeps his covenants. To encourage to come unto Christ and humble yourselves. To give people hope, the hope of him gathering those lost tribes back into him. Uh, and we're not talking necessarily about a place. We're talking about gathering into him. Um, that's the true gathering, according to the Book of Mormon, is gathering the, the, the repentant soul being gathered back to their creator, back to God. Um, and to understand the judgments of God that all are susceptible through sin to receive. Uh, the righteous will keep important records by which we will be judged. He prophesied there would be records kept. Um, but we are to come unto Christ and partake of his salvation. The importance of the Book of Mormon in the last days to beware of false doctrines and evil churches. That God will be merciful with his lengthened arm in keeping his covenant. Remember what his arm, arm outstretched and the arms of protection. Remember what that meant? What, what that was in previous classes. What does it mean to have, it's another way, of, it's, there's a word that it represents, but it's represented by the action of embracing someone in protection and safety. Mercy, yep. So God is merciful with his arm lengthened out. 
Uh, God will gather the righteous to him. Jesus is God the Father. Come unto Christ and he will fulfill all his covenants. Repent and know that he is God. And Jesus will gather the lost souls unto him if they repent. So having looked at the title page and the purpose of the Book of Mormon, each one of these can fit into the purposes of the Book of Mormon. They're all, it's all tied into the same message. God has been speaking to us through prophets the same exact message to repent and to come out of him, to don't give up hope that Jesus is coming. Jesus came and he's going to come again. You know, that's the same message that just keeps getting repeated over and over and over as he calls us to, to repent. Okay, so going back through ne Nephi 6, um, I kind of just went through and I highlighted, you know, I know we've already been through this, so this is kind of a refresher, but I did find a few new things that I hadn't found before, which is kind of amazing about the scriptures is that it's it's kind of like we were talking before. It's like a it's like a diamond. You know, you look at it one way and you see the beautiful shiny surface, but if you turn it a different way, it looks different. You see colors, you see, you know, different, the light hits it different ways. It's just the same diamond but it shines in a different way each time you look at it. And that's what the scriptures do as we look at it. Um, so as I went back through, sort of giving a kind of a high level overview, I saw some new stuff that I didn't see before. So I wanted to share that. Um, <clears throat> so Nephi tells us that his goal is to simply persuade all believers uh, or all people to believe in Jesus and to give hope. So this was the reason why he read um, the words of Isaiah, but, I, but that I might more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord, their Redeemer. Wherefore, I did read unto them that which is written by the prophet Isaiah. So think about how important Isaiah must have been in Nephi because he had to get down on those plates and hammer out all those symbols to rewrite this scripture that was in the, the brass plates to make it available to his future generations and to discuss it. So, and, he, and there's a lot of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon. And so it really had to be really important to him in order to go through that extra work you know, he didn't just copy and paste like we would do. You know, he had to literally pound it out in metal. Um, and so it says, Wherefore I spake unto them, saying, Hear ye the words of the prophet, ye which are a remnant of the house of Israel, a branch which have, which have been broken off. Hear ye the words of the prophet, which were written unto all the house of Israel, and liken it unto yourselves, that ye may have hope, as well as your brethren from whom ye have been broken off. So the next goal was that, or the next bullet point is that Isaiah can only be understood with the spirit of prophecy. We're not going to logically figure out Isaiah. It's got to be understood by the spirit of prophecy. And here he tells us in 2 Nephi 11, Wherefore, hearken, O my people, which are of the house of Israel, and give ear to my words. For because that the words of Isaiah are not plain unto you, nevertheless, they are plain unto all they that are filled with the spirit of prophecy. And if you look at Revelations 19, where it talks about the spirit of prophecy. It says, And I fell at his, I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see, that, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the testimony of Christ, having a knowledge of Christ, and whether he came to you in person, came to you in a dream, came to you, you know, his his still small voice, like we talked about today at church, um, that testimony is the spirit of prophecy. So it's with that testimony that you should be able to read Isaiah and understand it. Yes. It's also known as in Acts, Philip, Calvin, will be in the sees these reading Isaiah and he says, "You understand what you're reading?" And he goes, "How can I?" Unless somebody explains it. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so Isaiah starts. So this isn't the book. This isn't the, uh, Isaiah one. It's not the beginning of the book, um, but it's the beginning where Nephi begins to read. So he's reading. He grabs this section of Isaiah and starts reading. The first thing he talks about is how Isaiah is condemning Israel for sin. That's the first thing he he does is try to call them to repentance. And remember, he's talking to his brothers, Laman and Lemuel. They don't have the best track record. Considering they tried to kill him a few times, right? They're already in the new world. They've gone through all of this. And now he's talking to his brother and explaining to them 
what what they what he's reading to them. And so um, on the right hand side of my screen here is the King's oops, is the um, uh, Bible, and then the left side is the Book of Mormon. And the ones that are in red are are not are are added. They're they were added to. They're not the same. Okay, the, the Isaiah of the Book of Mormon has got a few changes, and and there's some really significant ones, and I'll show those to you. Um, so I won't read through the whole thing, but it's just talking about um, here. It says, "Hearken, hear this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel." So he, this is kind of a kind of a a backhanded slap because he's saying their house of Jacob, meaning their descendants of Jacob, but they're not living like they are under covenant. Jacob was was the, their father before he made the covenant with God, right? Because God changed his name to Israel, so he became under covenant. So he's saying, "O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah." So your descendants of Judah, you're called house of, or you're, you call yourself house of Israel. But you're not living like that. And he says, which swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the make mention of the God of Israel, yet they swear not in the truth nor in righteousness. And with swear, meaning the covenant. They don't live under the covenant that they made with God. They're living outside of the covenant. Nevertheless, they call themselves of the holy city of Jerusalem or Zion or, you know, of the righteous but yet they do not stay themselves upon the God of Israel. Notice the difference here in over in the uh, in the Bible. It says, for they call themselves of the holy city and stay themselves. But here it says, they do not stay themselves. And and I and I, you know, obviously this is correct. They they do not stay themselves on God, um, which is the God of Israel, which is the Lord of hosts. Yea, the Lord of hosts is his name. So he's starting out by saying, you need to repent. So this verse, as I this is one of the things that I found. So as I'm reading this, I started to notice some things, especially the parts that are added that were not there before. They're not in the Bible. And I was trying to figure it out. So I put it on, I put I took just the scripture on my screen and I structured it in a different I put it in a different format so that I could look at it differently visually. So this is the exact same words. I just moved, I moved them, you know, I just like, you know, I moved the lines to make them line up. So this is a parallelism that is actually restored by the Book of Mormon to Isaiah. So hearken and hear, the, hear this. This is the same thing. Hearken means to hear this. That's a parallel. And then these is a, the parallels are used by in Hebrew writing to reinforce ideas. So you all you probably all heard of chiasms. Parallelisms are the same thing. It's a Hebrew um, writing structure. So here's the first one. There's a parallel. Second one. O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel, are come forth out of the waters of Judah, which swear by the name of the Lord. There's a parallel here. O house of Jacob, meaning those that have descended from the house of, of, of Judah, the waters of Judah. Waters is significant. It, it's a way of saying the womb, you know, the womb of the, the water of the, you know, the mother break, the water breaks. Out of the womb of Judah, um, and then which are called by the name of Israel. So they were called by the name of Israel because they were under covenant. God changed their name from Jacob to Israel. Same here, which swear by the name of the Lord. They took upon them the name of the Lord, because the L part of Israel is means God. So they took upon Israel. Jacob took upon himself the name of of God, just like the the people of Israel have sworn by the name of the Lord. They've taken upon them the name of the Lord. They made a covenant. So these are parallel lines, meaning the same thing, just rewording it in a different way. This next one does the exact same thing. And make mention of the God of Israel, yet they swear not in truth nor righteousness. Again, swearing, we're not talking about cuss words. We're talking about covenants, okay? So they, they, they mention the God of Israel, but they don't live under that covenant. They don't live in righteousness. And then look at the next line. They call themselves of the holy city. They say they're a house of Israel. They say they're, they've made covenant with God, but they don't live like that. They do not stay themselves upon the God of Israel. You see the parallels? Now here's the last one, which is the Lord of hosts. This was added. 
Yea, the Lord of hosts is his name. It sounds repetitive, but it's a perfect Hebrew parallel restored by the Book of Mormon version of Isaiah. So how many of you were able to watch that video? Um, okay, most people, okay. Um, so I put out a documentary on on the on the um, um, Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, so I I started studying the Dead Sea Scrolls as part of this as part of this, and I got so deep into it, and there was so much great information. I thought, well, I'll make a video and I'll just show the video to the to the class. Well, then the video turned into 28 minutes, and I didn't want to take up 28 minutes of class time showing the video, so that's why I asked you all just to watch it separately. Um, but there's some things about this that are really interesting. So those that didn't watch the video. Um, so the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1946 in Qumran. It's about 25 miles, 26 miles outside of Jerusalem. Um, and this particular scroll, so you probably all heard the story of the Bedouin shepherds. They threw a rock into a cave. They heard some pottery break. And so they went in to investigate and they found these, these um, cylinders with scrolls inside. Some were broken up, some were intact. And they found seven, they got seven parchments or scrolls that had writing on them, Hebrew writing. Um, and they and these are uneducated Bedouin shepherds. They didn't know what they were really looking at. So they gathered them all up. There were seven of them. And they took them back to their village. And they, they kind of hung them up in the tent, not really knowing what to do. They had them there for a little while and then decided to take them into Jerusalem to see if they could sell them, make some money, because they're all in the poor. Um, which they did. And of course, you know, right away, people were like, oh, those are frauds. Oh, you know, and then pretty soon they started figuring out, wait a minute, this, these aren't frauds. And so it's probably the greatest discovery of, you know, of our century, or, you know, maybe more. Um, but anyway, the Isaiah scroll is absolutely incredible because this is, this is the, the scroll, the whole thing. It's 24 feet long and it, it's, um, it's all, it's all 66 chapters of Isaiah. There's nothing missing. The whole book of Isaiah is in this one scroll. Now, ironically, there's actually 22 versions of Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls. What's going on here? Um, there's actually 22 versions, or you know, and there's some minor tweaks and differences in those. But this, the Great Isaiah Scroll, has all 66 chapters. The other ones are like little scraps and you know, pieces that are from Isaiah, but they're maybe not the whole book. So anyway, this thing is written in Hebrew. Um, it's written in the old Hebrew. The new Hebrew has like little hash marks and ac accent lines and tells you how to say the word. Um, this is written in the old Hebrew that didn't have that. So it's an older version. Um, they think that the Essenes, which were a Jewish sect, they were kind of a, they were the four, the forerunners of the Sadducees. So we've all heard of the Sadducees. They were very much into the law and, you know, they, they were, that's kind of their, that was their fathers, basically, was the Essenes. Um, they kind of lived out in the desert. They were, they didn't quite, they didn't fit in with the Pharisees, that group. Um, and they, they kept all these records. And so that's what we're finding in the desert. And they they found, they found more. There's a whole bunch. There was 12 caves in all. Um, and I forget how many books total. It was like, I want to say five, four, four or five hundred book, different books, not all scriptures. Some of them were like um, documents for like government. And, you know, there was one called the Temple Scroll that talks about the temple, the second temple, how it was built, all the details, the construction, all this, all kinds of stuff about the temple, um, how the tables are supposed to be arranged and, you know, lots of measurements. And it was very, almost like a like a blueprint for the temple, which was kind of interesting. Um, so anyway. This oh, this whole thing has been interpreted in English, translated into English, and then compared to what we have in the Masoretic, the Masoretic text, which is what we use to make the King James Version. That and the Septuagint were used to create the King James Version. And so there are a few minor differences, and I, and I just wanted to show you a little bit of that. Um, so what's interesting, though, is that this document, they, they, they've run all kinds of analysis. You know, the, they've, it's written on... It's written on um, parchment or on um, like animal skin, so they can test the DNA of the animal to find out, you know, how far back it went. Some of the tests ended up clear back at 356 BC. The newest ones 
are about 100 BC. So that's the range. They think based on the, the literary style and the way they form their letters and all that, that it dates to about 150 BC, um, which is pretty amazing because the Masoretic text, which is what was used to make the King James Version, dates back to 900 AD. So this is a thousand years older than the document that was used to create the King James Version of the Bible. Um, and th so just to show you, this is a piece of the, of the Septuagint. And so while they have some of the scriptures in the Septuagint, a lot of it ends up looking like this. You know, they're just little scraps here and there. There's a few letters, stuff missing, and they have to kind of fill in the gaps. And that's why a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls are as well. Um, so to get this whole thing looking like this is pretty amazing. Um, so I just wanted to show you one, one thing that was restored by the, by the great, by the Isaiah scroll. It's really fascinating. So this is not quoted in the Book of Mormon. So this is not part of the Book of Mormon, but it, it does do some of the same things as far as restoring this lost information. So the second one here is the great Isaiah scroll. And this highlighted part is added in the Isaiah scroll, not found in the Masoretic text. So it's not in the King James Version. Um, or or the inspired version for that. Um, it says, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, when you make, make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood, your fingers with iniquity. So this is a parallel. Hands being parallel to fingers and blood to iniquity. And so, you know, just like fingers are connected to hands, the iniquity is connected to the blood. You know, and, and so... I mean, it's not so much that the meaning is so profound, but it is a Hebrew parallel that was lost. Just scribal error or whatever over time, it was, it was not recorded. So, and we're told in the Book of Mormon that there's going to be things that have been lost from the biblical record. Things that, had, that were changed by scribes, that were altered, added to, you know, and some of them are honest errors. Some of them are just scribal errors. Because remember, they wrote this thing over and over and over for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And we're relying on the accuracy of scribes. Um, one thing they've found is sometimes, you know, in, par in, in Hebrew, they'll, they'll, the parallelism, it'll say the word, it'll say the sentence, and then it'll repeat the sentence in a slightly different way. Well, they've found a few that have just the one line, but don't have the second line. They think maybe the scribe saw that first word. And then when he went up to rewrite the, ne the next line, he lost his place because it was the start off with the same symbol, you know? So there's all kinds of, Things and I, I, you know, the, the um, scholars can dig into the details and say it a lot better than I can. But um, there are things that the that the this Isaiah scroll does restore to the text that you know that because it's a thousand years older than what we have today in the in the, in the Bible. Um, um, it also so back to the back to First Nephi six. Um, so Jesus clearly made himself known to Israel through miracles. It says, and I have, even from the beginning, declared to thee, before it came to pass, I showed them thee, and I showed them for fear, lest thou shouldst say, mine idol hath done them, and my graven image, and my molten image hath, com hath, hath commanded them. So God, from the very beginning, you know, with Israel, gave them miracles, showed them who he was, showed him that he was the only true God. He part the seed. He gave them manna for every day for 40 years. You know, he did that for them. He showed forth his power. So there was no questioning. They weren't able to give the glory to another God. They weren't be able to say, oh, well, the sun God did this for us. Um, and then even though Israel doesn't deserve it, God is still merciful. The fact that, that we have time right now, that we can sit here and talk about God and, you know, we're, we're not being shot at. We're not being, you know, run out of here. That's God's mercy, giving us this, this time to repent. Um, and then, so here it talks about, um, I'll skip to 16. Nevertheless, for my name's sake, will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain from thee, that I, that I cut thee not off. For behold, I have refined thee, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. You know, so he's saying, you know, even though you're not giving me praise, you're not giving me honor, you're not, you're not being faithful followers, 
I am, I am still refining you. I'm putting you through the fire of affliction. And, and I've chosen you even in that fire of affliction, in that furnace of affliction. Um, and all you have to do is come to me. That's what the message is. Then Jesus declares his identity to them again, and he reassures them that he will fulfill his promises. So remember the, remember the I am. You know, God, when Moses was asked, when he asked God, who, you know, who should we call you? The people want to know your name. Who are you? And God told him, I am. Just tell them that I am. You know, I don't have a name. I, I am God. I'm the only God. I am. Um, and so here he tells us, hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel. Notice Jacob and Israel, meaning the people that are descended and those that are living in the covenant. Listen, both of you need to listen. For I am he, and I am the first, and I am also the last. <clears throat> he then reminds the house of Israel of the covenant that was made with Abraham. So remember the covenant with Abraham. So it says, um, this is out of Genesis 22, and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this, I see notice the sworn there. Again, not cuss word, right? It's covenant. I've made a covenant with you. Saith the Lord, for behold, thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. Remember that phrase. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So how through the seed of Abraham were all of the nations of the earth blessed? Jesus. Jesus. Can you think of any better blessing than Christ dying on the cross? Him being a direct descendant of Abraham? <clears throat> so that's the covenant he made with Abraham. Notice here that in, that in Nephi 6, Isaiah is referring to that same covenant. Thy seed also hath been as the sand, the covenant with Abraham. The offspring of thy bowels, like the grave thereof, his, what, a oh, gravel, like the gravel thereof, sorry, his name should not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. And then he addresses those that are cut off in the house of Israel. And we're talking about Lehi's descendants, right? Um, and, uh, and other lost tribes, not just Lehi's. So this is this is really fascinating. I'm really excited about this. And, um, I found this actually yesterday. Um, so this verse here is in the Book of Mormon, and it is not found in the Bible. It's not in the Masoretic text. It's not in the Septuagint. And it's not in the old the King in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. So it you know the Dead Sea Scrolls, of course, were you know 400 years after the Book of Mormon, four or five hundred years after the the brass plates. So we're, we're getting all this off the brass plates. So for whatever reason, this was lost off the, out of the Bible. Um, and this is something that's be, that has been restored to Isaiah. And I and I found out something really cool about it. But let me let's read it first. And again, hearken, O ye house of Israel, all ye that are broken off and are driven out because of the wickedness of the pastors of my people. Yea, all ye that are broken off, that are scattered abroad, which are of my people, O house of Israel. And so this is a, you know, this is an admonition to the people to repent. And they've been led astray by, by the pastors of, their, of his people. Pastors is another word for shepherd. So actually in Spanish, pastor is shepherd. That's how you say shepherd in Spanish. Um, and so, um, and before I go to the next slide, I want to remind you that in the Book of Mormon, when it was translated, or when it was given, translated, um, there was no punctuation. There was no commas. There was no versing. There was just written straight out. When you look at the original manuscript, it's just all words, okay? So we've broken, you know, the the, the printer broke it up, you know, in, in, in chapters, and then um, later on in, you know, in the 19, I forget year, what year it was, 1857, I think, um, the RLDS did the versing, okay? Long after Joseph was dead. Um, 
So look what look what happens if you if you take away the versing and you just look at the words. Look what happens here. Look at this part that's that's in red and move that over to this over here. This is all in the same order. I haven't changed anything. I just moved the words over and lined them up. Look at this perfect chiasm. Hearken, listen, O Isles, O ye house of Israel, who are of my people, O house of Israel, all ye that are broken off and driven out, yea, all that are broken off that are scattered abroad. And the center point, which in Achaia is in the center point, is the focus of what this verse is about because of the wickedness of the pastors of my people. So trusting in the arm of flesh, following the shepherds, the wrong shepherds, you know, is the center point of this verse um, to calling us to repentance. And this, this verse is, is given, it's, it's hope. It's hope to the lost tribes of Israel. It's hope to all those that don't know Christ because they're scattered abroad um, and he's saying, listen to me. And then he says, the Lord hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother, hath he made mention of my name. In other words, he's saying, you are not lost to God. Even though you, you might not know who you are, you are called. Even those that are on the, and the isles of the sea, um, it, it actually doesn't necessarily mean islands. It also means faraway places. It's a Hebrew way of saying a far off place. So certainly would apply to the house of Israel that are on this continent. Those that are in a faraway place, it's an, it's an isle of the sea, it's a long ways away. You're not lost. God knows who you are. You read that, it makes you wonder if that was something that was just an honest mistake you said, or if it was intentionally left out. Like if someone was translating and someone came behind and said, oh no, that makes me look bad. Don't say that. Take that verse out. I won't it's in me. Yeah. It's yeah. It could be, yeah. And, and you would you would like to think that it was just some honest mistake, but yeah, well, yeah, it's sitting here saying, you know, the wicked, your wicked leaders. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. You know that verse 31, if you leave, listen, it, it's another parallel. Got listening, Martin. You got the Lord called me from the womb, the bowels of my mother, and you mentioned the name. I wonder what the next one is. Yeah, that's it's true. That more parallel. Yeah, it's amazing how how this these parallelisms and these um, chiasms work. Sometimes you have chiasms chiasms within chiasms, and they overlayer each other. And uh, I mean, it's just amazing that the how they wrote. Yeah, somehow Joseph was supposed to know all of. Yeah, this. yeah, Maybe the farm kid. Yeah, young teenager. You, even though chi right, even though chiasms and parallelisms weren't discovered until the 1940s or whatever, 1950s or whatever. Yep. Okay, and then so Jesus is the perfect Israel. He is the he is the 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 intent of God or the plan of God was for Abraham's seed to become like Jesus was, perfect, whole, innocent, complete, and righteous. Jesus became that perfect Israel and fulfilled the the covenant that God had made with Abraham. It says, and he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver he hath made me and said unto me, thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Now, there are a lot of people that say that this is this scripture is written to Israel as a whole. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not saying I have the answers, but if you read the next chapter, which, which we're going to get to, which we may not get to today, but... Um, where Nephi is talking to his brothers about these passages, I think the, the message becomes pretty clear what he's what and who he's talking about. Um, so what do you like when Yeah. To me, it's kind of saying me speaking more to the spiritual side, like the people who are in the house of Israel are those who are repentant. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the DNA aspect. Right. They're, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. Because his servants can be those who are obedient, not those who just say that we're not supposed to. Right. Well, and God is... can't be glorified in Satan evil. Yeah. Well, and God is going to be glorified through Jesus. Right, exactly. You know, righteous humans don't glorify God. We're all filthy rags. Mm -hmm. You're saying, you know, we are supposed to be like Jesus and not submit to the Spirit. Mm -hmm. You can be that servant too. And that's what 
grab the specs from and house the treasure. Right. And just come in three times. Then we'll add, and that's what I'm hearing. And that's mm -hmm. what you were bit more. Yeah. Okay, so Jesus is God's covenant to man, to man and that is our only salvation. Um, and I'll skip down to here. It says, uh, thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, O isles of the sea. And in, in, in the, this has been, this is not in the King James Version or in any version of the Bible. Uh, o isles of the sea, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee my servant, which is also not found in any of the versions. So given, give thee my servant for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. heritages. It is the gift of Christ, the gift of God taking upon himself flesh that allows for Israel to be redeemed. Otherwise, all of us fall under the justice of our sin. And then Jesus will gather his people, and they will no longer be smitten. So it says, And then, O house of Israel, behold, these shall come from far. And lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinem. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth. For the feet of them which are in the east shall be established. This is a callback to another part of Isaiah that says, How beautiful are the feet of those, you know, that have heard that scripture. That is a Hebrew, like Hebrew way of speaking, is referring back to when Babylon, when they were when they were informed that they were free, that they could go back to Israel. When when Cyrus the Great took over, you know, conquered Nebuchadnezzar, conquered Babylon, um, he freed Israel and let them go back to Jerusalem and, build, and rebuild the temple. Um, and they even gave them all the temple artifacts and everything except for the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and so. The phrase was, how beautiful are the feet, are the mountains, or how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bring good tidings, good tidings that were freed. You know, so this became a kind of a, a phrase that they used. So here it's used again. For the feet of them which are in the east shall be established and break forth into singing no mountains, for they shall be smitten no more. So it's a callback to that being smitten under the hand of, of a brutal you know, ruler of, in Babylon to being freed. Um, for the Lord hath comforted his people. Uh -huh. and, I mean, like the whole description that uh, is mercy. And then, it, then at the end, it says it again. You have mm -hmm. mercy upon you. So it's like giving you a physical understanding of what mercy is really like. Yeah. Yeah. You feel oppressed and you're free. Right. Yeah. It's almost like a parallelism, a parallelism of ideas. Right. You know, between physical and spiritual. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And then again, he's going to show that he has not forgotten his people. Notice here this extra sentence, but he will show that he hath not, meaning that he hath not forgotten. Now, this one in particular, and this is just my speculation, I think maybe Nephi comment giving commentary and not necessarily out of the Isaiah. Because he's saying, you know, he's reading out, this is out of Isaiah, but behold, Zion hath said, the Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. And then we have this sentence that says, but he will show that he hath not. And then it goes back into Isaiah again, for can a woman forget her sucking child? You know, so that may or may not be the case, but it seems to me like that's Nephi giving a little commentary between the Isaiah verses. Remember, he's just talking to his brothers here. He's not trying to reestablish Isaiah. He's just talking to his brothers, trying to convince them to repent. Um, it's interesting that it says, O house of Israel, yea, they may not forget, yet I will not forget thee, O house of Israel. Those that have made a covenant with God, he won't forget. That it's not house of Jacob, it's house of Israel, right? And then behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands, thy walls are continually before me. <clears throat> um, we're also, it also shows that he will use the Gentiles in the last days to help redeem his people. Thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. Now, all this is the same in both. 
there wasn't any changes made to Isaiah in this part. And then all people will know that he is God. He will reveal himself to all. And I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh. They shall be drunken with their own blood as with the sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. And Shay, can you go back to that? Yeah. Huh? Um, why do you think in that last line he said, and that Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob and not the Mighty One of Israel? Do you think he's stating that even those who are not under the covenant will still have the opportunity to repent and come under that covenant? Maybe. Or it's, it's, it's just interesting that you would use that. I think, and I and I may be wrong on this, but I've, if I remember right, Mighty One of Jacob is a is a way of describing that his came from the physical DNA or the physical, you know, he was a descendant of Abraham through Jacob, you know, being his grandson. Um, it may be talking about the physical fulfillment of the prophecy that, you know, he was of that blood, but I could be wrong. But a good point. Okay, so now we're moving into chapter seven. So this is Nephi. Everything we just looked at, this is Nephi telling his brother, he, you know, Nephi's written all this stuff out and or said it all to his brothers, and now he's explaining it. So, so it says, and it came to pass that after I, Nephi, that after I had received these, after I had read these things, which were engraven upon the plates of brass, my brethren came unto me and said unto me, what meaneth these things which ye have read? So what does all this mean, right? Uh, and it says, Behold, are they to be understood according to the things which are spiritual, which shall come to pass according to the spirit and not the flesh? And I, Nephi, saith unto them, Behold, they were made manifest unto the prophet by the voice of the spirit. For by the spirit are all things made known unto the prophets, which shall come upon the children of men according to the flesh. Wherefore, the things of which I have read are things pertaining to both temporal and spiritual. So, these are prophecies that are going to come to pass, both physically, but also spiritually. There's going to be a redemption of Israel. Remember, we're talking, he's in 600 BC. So, you know, Israel's not been taken into, taken into bondage yet into Babylon. You know, they haven't been freed. They haven't gone back to, none of that's happened yet. So he saw that and he's talking about that. But he's also talking about this a future date where there's this spiritual bondage where the people are gathered back to Christ. They were gathered back physically back to Israel, and they're going to be gathered phys or spiritually back to Christ. So it's both physical and spiritual. It says, for it appears that the house of Israel, and he's, he's given commentary on what he's just read. For it appears that the house of Israel, sooner or later, will be scattered upon all the face of the earth and also among all nations. So he's being shown that they're going to be sent everywhere, including his own people, the Nephites. And behold, there are many which are already lost. You remember what happened when Nephi or when Lehi read the brass plates for the first time? Remember what he, it says he was amazed? Remember why he was amazed? Yeah, he found out that he was of the seed of Manasseh. He didn't even know. You know, here he was living. In, so what happened when 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 um, uh, the Syria, Syria conquered the northern kingdom? A lot of those people fled into the southern kingdom. This was in... Now, this is 100 years before Nephi or before Lehi. And so a lot of those people over time didn't even know who they were from, what the tribe they were a part of, their, you know, their history. You know, we we all see it as kind of all happening in this time tight time frame. But we're talking hundreds of years, you know, between a lot of these events and time gets lost. You know, how how many how many times have you looked in like you go to like a genealogy website and you find out, hey, am I? Great uncle was, you know, so and so or whatever. And we have no idea, right? Our heritage doesn't necessarily follow us. Well, Lehi was that same way. He had no idea he was tribe of Manasseh, descendant of Joseph. That was said. They're they're already lost from the knowledge of they that are Pat or right. They, yeah. The people living in Jerusalem or their heritage is right. They they're they're in Jerusalem, they're Jews, but they have no idea of their 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 past, nor do they have any idea of the covenants that God has made with them. Um, so they needed a restoration of that truth even back in Lehi's day, which is probably probably why they got led into bondage, because they had abandoned God. 
they were in idolatry. They were just thinking about the world and its riches. And, you know, they had, they had broken their covenant with God. And they got taken into bondage because of it. Um, it says, yea, the more part of all the tribes have been led away. And they are scattered to and fro upon the isles of the sea. And whither they are, none of us knoweth. Save that we know that they have been led away. All we know is they've been taken away. I mean, they could have been in China. They could be in India. You know, we don't even know where all these people were taken as prisoners. And, you know, um, a lot of these, a lot of these um, conquering nations, would come, these empires would come in and they would grab the locals and they would take them back as slaves you know, and marry them off and everything else, take away their religion, take away their, any of their written documentation, and they would just be, just be lost to their knowledge. Their next, the next generation born wouldn't even know their past, you know, within a few generations, they were now Assyrians or whoever they were, you know, taken over by. And so it says, whether they are, none of us know, and say it be that we know they have been led away. And since that they have been led away, these things have been prophesied concerning them, and also concerning all they which shall hereafter be scattered and be confounded because of the Holy One of Israel, for against him will they harden their hearts. Wait, it's kind of funny. This, he was talking about Isaiah. And Isaiah is 1600 years before. Hindsight's supposed to be 2020. He, he's 100, 150 years before. Exactly. But it's supposed to be 2020, and they're still asking what we need. Yeah. So it, it's funny because it says that last verse even talks about it. We prophesy these things all the time, but your hard hearts are being found it, and still, they still don't understand. Them, right? right. Yeah, this that dwindling in unbelief, generation after generation, just gets further and further and further away. Look what's happening in our world right now. You know, with all the all the stuff that we're seeing with the schools and kids and, you know, I mean, it, we have dwindled as a nation, you know, just in, just since our formation of our nation. You know, when you, we, you know, we're the land of the home, land of the free and the brave and all that, you know, where you could go out and you get to buy a piece of land and you can just build a farm and you can, well, now you try to do that, you know, you got to get government permits and you got to pay all the taxes and you've got to, you know, it, just to build a building, it's a nightmare because of all the red tape and government control. And, you know, we're not the land of the free anymore, like we, like we were in the beginning. And over, over time, it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. Some posted that they just got a thing from the teacher asking for a release for their kid to say they fled to the Guys, that's crazy. And that's not really no. <laughs> and so the temporal meaning uh, is that the Israelites will be scattered, but they will preserve, be preserved by the Gentiles, and and this will repeat. So they were preserved. Remember when they got taken into Babylon, they were they were um, the um, Cyrus the Great of Persia conquered Babylon, which those were those were all Gentiles, right? And they freed Israel to go back to their homelands. So that that scripture temporally or you know physically was was fulfilled, or at least one version of it was fulfilled. I think it repeats, you know, through time. Um, because we see that scattering happen again by the Gentiles that are on this continent, scattering the, the Native Americans. Um, wherefore they shall be scattered among all nations and shall be hated by all men. Nevertheless, after they have been nursed by the Gentiles, and the Lord hath lifted up his hand upon the Gentiles and set them up for a standard, and their children shall be carried in their arms. Now he's going back and he's quoting from Isaiah again right here. He's reminding them, this is what it's talking about. The Gentiles are going are gonna to be like nursing fathers and nursing mothers to our, to our generations to, to preserve us. Um, behold, these, these things of which are spoken are temporal. For thus are the covenants of the Lord with our fathers, and it meaneth us in the days to come. So it's going to happen to the house of Israel, you know, in just a few years, you know, in their time with Babylon. But then it's going to happen again when Lehi's seed is scattered across the Americas and is, you know, is gathered back to Christ again. It's going to happen again. And it says, and also our brethren, which are of the house of Israel. 
Then it's then it then it prophesies he prophesies of a mighty nation upon this land. Of course, he's here when he's saying all this, right? He's in the Americas. And it meaneth that the time cometh that after all the house of Israel have been scattered and confounded, that the Lord God will raise up a mighty nation among the Gentiles. Yea, even upon the face of this land, and by them shall our seed be gathered, gathered or scattered. So I mean, can you think of any other description other than America and the Native Americans being scattered that, that fits this? There's never been any kind of mighty nations anywhere on the, the North, or, North or South American continents that even compare to the United States in terms of power, in terms of scattering, you know, all the things, all the elements that fit this. And through that nation, the Book of Mormon came forward that restored those covenants to the house of Israel. It says, wherefore it is likened unto their being nursed by the Gentiles and being carried in their arms and upon their shoulders. Uh, and back up one. And after that our seed is scattered, the Lord God will proceed into a marvelous work among the Gentiles, which shall be of great worth unto our seed. The bringing forth of the Book of Mormon, restoring all those covenants that were lost to knowledge, now restored and available to the seed of Lehi, to where they can be gathered back into to Christ. Um, and I'll make this my last slide. Um, and so it says here, and it shall it shall all it shall it shall also be of worth unto the Gentiles, um, and not only to the Gentiles, but unto all the house of Israel, unto the making known of the covenants of the Father of heaven unto Abraham, saying, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. It was through the seed of Abraham, which was Christ, that all the nations of the earth received salvation spiritual salvation and i would my brethren that you should know that all the kindreds of the earth cannot be blessed unless he shall make bare his arm in the eyes of all the nations what does it mean to make bare your arms so they this in this time they wore robes right long robes that covered covered all the way down to their wrist to, to protect from the sun but when they went into battle those robes would get in the way so they would roll up the, they like roll them up. They gird up their loins. And they take the bottom and they kind of tie it up. So their legs were were, were were kind of like a pair of shorts. Kind of their legs were exposed, and their arms were bare, so they could they could get busy. They could get in, go into battle, be ready to fight. And so that's a way of saying that God is going to do the same. God is going to make bare His arms. He is going to start doing a mighty work among His people, among those that repent. Um, and he's and he's going to do it in front of all the nations. It's almost like our saying, "Holy Spirit." Yeah, exactly. Yep. Wherefore the Lord God will proceed to make bare His arms in the eyes of all the nations, in bringing about His covenants and His gospel. Gospel is what the good news, right? And good news is Christ. His covenants and His gospel unto they which are of the house of Israel. And that's what you know we're. We find ourselves right in this storyline, you know, of, of the Gentiles being used to scatter the house of Israel, but also being used to bring forth this great and marvelous work, bringing forth the Book of Mormon so that it's available again, so that the house of Israel can be regathered unto God. I was about to ask, do you think that we're, like, if you were to take a pin and say, you are here? That would probably be best. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, don't think that, I don't think that we have necessarily done all of the uh, taking them on our shoulders and you know nursing them I don't think we've done all that yet maybe we have to some degree but um, I mean we certainly have helped protect Israel the nation of Israel but on this continent I don't think the seat of Lehi has been all that well cared for up to this point um, yeah that's true man. that's true we, yeah Thank you. that's true we supported their casinos right <laughs> um, but anyway it's exciting if you read all this and you lay it out on the timeline and you look at what God is doing, and you look at why he's doing it, and the, you look at Isaiah, and then you look at what Nephi is understanding as he reads Isaiah. You know, there, if you if you go online and you Google, you know, what does Isaiah whatever mean, Isaiah 53, what does it mean? You know, you'll get all kinds of answers. 
Is there, they'll say, oh, it's talking about Israel. It's talking about Jesus. It's, there's some that say it's even talking about Joseph Smith. The servant that's going to, you know, rise up is going to be Joseph Smith. You know, you've got all these reasons and understanding. But then when you read what Nephi says, it, it, it clarifies it, brings it all in, takes away the speculation. And you see that Nephi is talking about restoring the house of Israel, the people that make a covenant with God to their, to their heavenly father so that we are not lost. Whether we're Neph whether we're Gentiles or or House of Israel, we're not lost to Him. There are no lost tribes to God, um, and so we'll we'll continue this. I was hoping I'd get into more of this because I love I love hearing Nephi's interpretation of what he's what he's been reading, but we'll have to have that to look forward to um, for next week. So thank you.